Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. In 1776, Samuel Shaw, the mayor of Boston, referred to New York City as, quote, a motley connection of all nations under heaven. Today, the city is even more motley and more colorful, truly an immigrant melange. Immigrants make up 37% of the city's population, and with their sons and daughters, 55%, the highest level since 1910. There are 168, quote, home language spoken in New York's public schools. New York's demographic ballet has more and diverse participants who are dramatically changing the city as they themselves are changed, making the city a continuing dynamo of reinvention, a permanently unfinished city. Joining me to talk about contemporary immigrants and immigration in New York is Professor Nancy Fona, Distinguished Professor of Sociology at Hunter College and the CUNY Graduate Center, and one of the country's leading immigrant scholars. Nancy has just published one out of three immigrant New York in the 21st century. The latest of her influential studies on immigration in New York, other U.S. and world cities. Nancy, welcome. Oh, welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, no, this it's a great. pleasure. I mean, we go back forever. That's true. I mean, yeah. long time. Okay. So I'm reading this, and I'm on to page 120, and I have, I have to stop. And, quote, New York offers many fortunes but unequal opportunities to newcomers. Not everyone can make it here. New York is like a happy melting pot for some, a pressure cooker for many others, and still a dumpster for the unfortunate, quoting a Chinese immigrant. I mean, it sort of captures the entire book. Sort of paint the picture of immigration, 2010, New York. Okay, so the reason I did this book was because so much is always changing, as you said in the beginning, with immigrant New York. Here we are in, what, 2014, and the city is just an immigrant city once again. The numbers are astounding. astounding. You mentioned the percentages, 37% foreign-born, 55% if you add on the U.S.-born children. That's 5 million people. That's the population of Norway. Right. I mean, it's kind of astounding. We don't like to, you know, I, we don't like to brag in New no, York. No, we right? don't want to be in Of course we like to brag. <laughs> right. Well, we have a lot of immigrants and children of immigrants in this city. And... What's new? Well, what's new it depends on where you're comparing it to. Okay, let's com let's compare it to new immigrants in New York, which is what, 2001? That was 2001. So that's 13 years ago. This is a breakthrough book, but I went back and read it. It's changed. Talk about well, those changes. I mean, one thing that's changed is Mexicans are a much larger group. In 1990, Mexicans were tiny in New York. Even and by and in the metropolitan area. Yeah, the whole metro area. By now, by 2010, which is the book looks at 2010 census right. data, uh, Mexicans were the, t were the third largest immigrant group in New York. And they're all over. They're all over the city. There and all over the region. I mean, I live in northern New Jersey, mm -hmm. and there's a town where I can get real homemade Mexican food. There are other new groups. I mean, Mexicans have become the top, now the top three. So that's a big change. There are a lot of other new groups. One of the groups in the books, Liberians. <laughs> I know Wait you a say minute. Liberians. I'm, I'm Liberians <laughs> on the north shore of Staten, Staten Island. Island. Actually, one other new thing is, if you look at Staten Island, a, a fifth of the population of this Staten is, Island is now far I know. I, it was you know, people think of it exactly as this white middle you know, class. You know, the Italian Americans, the yeah. Benson yeah. to go to, but there are a lot of immigrants right. there. And, and, and a lot of immigrants are just skipping the city altogether. Where I live in Morris County and Passaic County in New Jersey, they're moving directly in. They're skipping the city. Well, if we stay in the city, okay, so there's Liberians Go ahead. on Staten Island who Bernadette Lugwood talks about in her chapter. Right. Okay, but they're, 
only one of the many West African groups that have come. There are a lot of Ghanaians, there are a lot of Nigerians. Senegalese. Senegalese. So Africans are a growing group in New York City. Another growing group are Pakistanis and Bangladeshis. Right. They've grown in large number. So we have new groups. We have new neighborhoods. I mean, it's almost like, you know, when I, used, when I first wrote this book, we would say, well, we have Washington Heights, which is a Dominican neighborhood, and Brighton Beach, which is a Russian neighborhood. And yes, and, you know, um, Washington Heights still has a lot of Dominicans right. living there. Brighton right. Beach still has a right. lot of Russian Jewish immigrants. But there are now more Dominicans in the Bronx yep. than in Manhattan. Yep, and that has political implications, it, congressional races, yes, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. The Russian Jews yep. have scattered around Brooklyn. They are also a in community Queens. in Queens, which I like. 108th Anthony. Street. I grew up in that neighborhood in the 50s and I love 60s. that. Annalise Orlick says they're affectionately known as Queens. Queens is stand. Oh, no, but it's definitely 108th Street Asian. is clearly, you know, you have a Russification of New With York. With Central Asian Jews. Right, yeah. and also... Jews are different than the Jews I grew up with. I, when I grew up with Jews, they were sort of your classic, more liberal, more Manhattan. That ain't, you know, you go to Brooklyn and Borough Park, that ain't those Jews, and it's no. not those Jews in Brighton Beach. No. So that's changed. So go that, ahead. So that's changed. Okay. There's new um, ethnic niches, all right? You know, and uh, look in the street in my neighborhood, right? Where do you live? On the Upper East Side. Okay. Every corner has a Bangladeshi street vendor. Come on! Right, that's something new. Pian Gott Min, in his chapter on Koreans, talks about how the two most uh, popular uh, small businesses for Koreans are now nail salons and dry cleaners, well, and, and, which has a change. I and, mean, and, uh, the nail salons is, a, is an excuse immigrant me. invention. In my town in northern New Jersey, <laughs> right. both things. Right. So, I mean, the stereotypes are real. Well, in terms of Koreans and small business, right. yes. But, um, so these are just some of the changes that have occurred. And, the, you know, the numbers, obviously, are huge, um, you know, in terms. So there's a lot of changes going on. Oh, and there's always changes. And at the same time, and this edition of the book actually has a chapter called The Next Generation. Right. Because by right. now... The clothes. Would by you? now, you know, when I wrote the other books, the second generation was growing and a lot of them were children. Yep. Now the second generation are taking their place as young adults. Right. And actually, we have a third generation. Right. And then the new immigrants of the earlier book are now aging. old. Yeah, they're and they're old. aging. And you've got this new generation. So let, let's step back a moment. Why are the new immigrants coming up? Are they coming for the exact same reason that my grandparents did? Many of the same reasons, yes. So and we have to look at, there are two issues, really. Go ahead. Okay, one is why are they coming to the United States? Right. Okay. And then the second issue is why are they coming to New York? Right. Okay, so Let's first, with, so okay, first we ahead. have to look at the United States. Go ahead. Okay, so one of the big changes was in 1965. Sure. The law change. The hot seller. Uh, yeah. And that eliminated national origins quotas, which had been put into place in the 1920s, yep. actually deliberately to restrict the immigration of Southern and, uh, Eastern, Southern and Eastern Europeans. Right. Okay, we so, want West European white folks. Right. So that, that was done away with. The big winners from that were Asians, actually, because mm -hmm. okay? they, they were subject to very you know, big restrictions in being able to come to mm -hmm. the U.S. In the New York area, also West Indians, that affected. Okay. So the law was very important. Economic reasons are overwhelmingly yep. important, and that's true in the past, it's true now. Uh -huh. Immigrants come here because they want to make more money, they want higher living standards because they can't find that in their home countries. Right. Okay, so the economic factors. Political factors, I mean, we mentioned again the Liberians, you know, a bloody, horrible, horrible civil war that they were fleeing. Many of them were living in refugee camps in Africa before they came here. The Ch you know, Chinese case, political. Yep. Russian Jews, political. political. And then in every case, once you get a community here, it tends to be self-perpetuating. The social networks mm -hmm. operate because people can send, they send for their relatives, they send money for the, to enable yep. them to come. In yep. today's world, you need a visa, yep. you need someone to sponsor you, um, and they give you a place it's to a stay. It's a precipitant, it, it attracts. I mean, I, almost every group in the world has enough people here that they can form a community. And that's one of the reasons they come to New York. Okay, okay. go ahead. So one of the reasons people come to New York is because they've got a community right. ready. Right, right. 
So that is a reason. Now, they also come because they can get jobs. If there, you know, if there was a community here and they couldn't get work, right. presumably many of them would come and then they'd leave. Right. They'd go to other places yep. in the U.S. Yep. But they're not. They're staying. Many of them are staying. I mean, some of them do go elsewhere. Sure. But many of them stay. And so there's work. There's housing. New York is a comfortable place for immigrants as a city. Well, we are other, truly, and this, this certainly demonstrates we're also, an immigrant city. Yes, yeah, so I think that also people come because they feel at home. Right. So I think for all those reasons is why New York attracts immigrants. Okay, now, you make the case, and, and so did the contributors, that New York is a special immigrant city. I mean, L.A. is an immigrant city in, in many ways. Chicago is, and Houston is, but we're different. How are we different? Why are we different? And what impact does our difference have? Uh, okay, that's this is, one of this, this is a is, thesis this right is, here. Yes, somewhere. it is. I talk about it in the introduction, Go and ahead. and it's you know sort of well, let me count the ways. I mean, it's so many ways. Okay, first, New York is the quintessential immigrant city in America. The new immigration, if we look at it post sixties, right was not this sudden, you know, burst of immigration in New York, as it was in many other cities. Like L.A. Yeah, which hadn't been used to immigration. Yep. New yep. York is used to immigration. Yep. Yep. If you look at the figures in the book, the lowest percentage that immigrants were of the total population in New York in the 20th century was 1970. Right. And that was after a very, you know, a lull. Yep. It was 18%. So even then, it wasn't that low. Right, it's a fifth. And what does this mean? It means also that, um, that mo the vast majority of New Yorkers have a close immigrant connection. Okay. So you've got your immigrants, that's 37%. Right. You add on their U.S.-born children, that's 55%. Then you add on the grandchildren of immigrants, like me. Right. I mean, I am the grandchild of immigrants. Excuse me, okay? me too. <laughs> Although my grandparents came as very small children, but okay, they're immigrants. Right. Um, add on the gray, you know, so we're talking a lot of Italians and Jews. Right. And Irish. Right. Um, add on, the three eyes. Yeah, right. And exactly. And then you've got the vast majority of New Yorkers, even many black New Yorkers, have their origins in the Caribbean migration sure. at the turn of the 20th right. century. Right. The Dubois immigration. It was a, right. it was a smaller yep. immigration yep. than we have now, yep. but still. So every, I really, the majority do have a close immigrant connection. Another difference from New York is the extraordinary diversity of our immigrant population. Just Key. extraordinary. Talk. Extraordinary. In the United States as a whole, first of all, Mexicans are overwhelmingly the largest group. I would they say are, probably Chicago, L.A., and Houston. Yes, yes. As the, it, they're, well, first of all, look at the p big picture. Go ahead. About 30% of the immigrants in the U.S. are from Mexico. Wow. So that's huge. Yes. Okay. In other big cities, Mexicans are overwhelmingly the dominant group. Uh -huh. In L.A., they're over 40 percent. In Houston and Chicago, they're almost 50 percent mm -hmm. of all immigrants. Uh -huh. In New York, 6 percent. Right, but growing. Growing, but stick still just 6 yeah. percent. Yeah. So what? But 6 percent of the larger base makes but a difference. Also, so. we have to think of the top three groups in New York are Dominicans, Chinese, and Mexicans, mm -hmm. and they represent about 30% of the total immigrant that's population. That's not that much. No, it's not that much. And then no other, the other groups are, you know, have, you know, 5%, 4%, 3%, and below. What this means is there are large numbers of many different groups in New York. Which has, and it, go ahead. And I just want to make one go, other point, because I think it's relevant in, in terms of relations in New York, is that every racial, big racial group in New York has a high percentage of immigrants. Yep. So look at Asians. About three quarters of Asians in New York are foreign born. Look at Latinos, about half are foreign born. But whites, about a quarter of the whites in New York are foreign born. That's because we've had continued European immigration. Nice, interesting. Blacks, blacks in New York, about a third foreign born because we've had this huge West Indian migration. And, and now we're growing with the African. African. Yeah, so you see it in your classrooms. This class is months. unlike other cities, where in other cities what you get is it's the Latino and the Asian population right. that's foreign born. Right. Sometimes you right. don't even have a big black population, right. but it's mostly not foreign right. born. Right. And then you have And then when the, the whites are right. not so. So this is a city, I think that is an important factor in New York, actually, in, in, in creating a relatively friendly environment for immigrants. So, I mean, that's also New York is a city that likes to celebrate immigrants. Yep. Yep. We have the parades. 
we have come on the parades right. are the best. immigrant I mean, the West Indian parade is the best but and I mean, the biggest and the big we have immigrant heritage week we have what I always love is parking rules right alternate oh, signs I love it go ahead regulations are suspended on 34 religious and legal holidays now, of across all continents all, and all religions so it's the Christian holidays the Jewish holidays but it's two Muslim holidays right. It's the hol Chinese Lunar New Year. Indian holiday. It's the Diwali, which right. was a very funny case Go. because that was instituted a number of years ago, and um, it was it, the city council passed it. Mayor Bloomberg actually vetoed it uh, because he said that too many, too many holidays. Yeah. And the, then the city council overrode the veto. So there is a Diwali, and Clyde Haberman had a funny, very funny column in which he said New York celebrates. Um, diversity by having dirty streets. That's right. <laughs> right. I mean, and, and, and yeah. Clyde and his wisdom yeah. hit it right on the head. Also, I mean, you, the, the issue of school holidays is there, too. Wow. I mean, how many school holidays do you have? You're going to have all school, the, the well, larger number of groups. That's an Come issue. Come on. You it's need kind to of atavistic because, you know, we have the Jewish holidays off. Oh, uh, they me. were instituted in 1960 when there were a lot of Jewish students yep. in the school, when there yep. were a lot of Jewish teachers. And they ruin our academic <laughs> schedule, those people. But right. it doesn't make sense. Fourteen percent of the population of the whole schools are white. Forget Jewish. So in a way, I mean, um, de Blasio is talking about adding some other holidays. Yes. They're talking about sure. a Muslim holiday, yep. Yep. maybe a Chinese holiday. Yeah. I think ultimately that's going to happen. The question is, do you take away the Jewish ones? Oh. Well, the oh. Oh, the no, right. I don't know. Yeah. That's going to be I a But I mean, clearly issue. that is both symbol and substance of the nature of the changes mm -hmm. that are going on. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this increased diversity in terms of the number of groups. I mean, clearly that's got political and social impacts as well. Politically, there ain't one group or two groups or three groups that are dominant, but you've got to make coalitions. Let me ask a question. What percentage of the New York City population is currently non-Hispanic white? About a third? 33%. Okay, exactly 33%. So one would figure that the old sort of ethnic balance tickets work and don't work because you've got all these different ethnicities. It's a challenge. <laughs> it's a challenge for politicians. It was easy to have, well, I don't know if it was easy, but the old balance ticket, you know, have a, an Irish, Jewish, Italian. Oh, I can name that's, them all. Yeah, it's not going to work anymore. Well, but, but at the same time, you've got this perkling up at the local level. You know, you have John Liu being elected to the council and then citywide. You have Grace Meng local, and then Congress. So you've got all... And, and a lot of city council seats now. Right. Fifteen, well, you've got Albanians, you've got everything. 15 of the 51 now, council seats, yep. are first and second generation, generation. immigrants. Absolutely. So that's a big change. Yeah, it is. And then you've got the mayoral administration being very favorably oriented toward immigrants because mm -hmm. it's part of their base. Yeah. But as you point out, the council particularly also does that. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the backgrounds of the various mm -hmm. folks, the Blasio's the old, one of the old eyes, but the rest, mm -hmm. I mean, Oh, he has an African-American wife. That's right. And then he's got, and uh, she's you know, Caribbean of origin. <laughs> right. And then you've got, you've got, you've got a, a, a black uh, public advocate. You've got a Latina as speaker of the council. I mean, it's a different mm -hmm. city. I remember when uh, Mark Viverito was named speaker, mm -hmm. It was in Spanish. A lot of the, the, the speeches mm -hmm. were in Spanish, and mm -hmm. there was a, there's a change under... Well, I think on, there's a change well, under... Undergo. Yeah, and that's because the immigrants, many of them are naturalizing, right, so they can vote. Right. And their children are coming of age, and they're voting. And so, it's, you know, the electorate is changing. Right. Talk about this next generation and what... What are the changes that the, the, the children of the new immigrants, sort of the, the new second generation, I don't know what you call them. We in academics call them the second generation. Oh, okay. okay. Although okay. we also have this phrase, the 1.5 generation, and that refers to those who are born abroad yep. and came here as young children. Which makes... And had their schooling a, Which here. is a useful distinction. Yeah, it is. It, actually, according to that category, my grandparents were 1.5 generation, oh. but we didn't have that category. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's... And it may, well, that's a really important subject, because look at New York City. If you look at the under-18s in New York City, two-thirds of them are second generation or 1.5 right. generation. And, and that's the world that they're growing and up And demographically, in. there are a lot of Chinese and Latinas, Latinos well, because they tend to be younger as well. Well, it's got all groups. It's got everything. It's okay. got everybody. Okay. You teach at CUNY. You oh. see it in your class. Oh, man. 
I mean, clearly, you know, beginning in 1980, I've seen, and you've seen too, you know who's coming in because they're in your classroom. I guess there's three places, the public schools, city university, and the jails. That's where you know where the demography <laughs> well, is. Well, I mean, that, it's, so these, these second generation and 1.5 generation right. are coming of age. They're going to school. The big study that was done on them by my colleagues, Phil Kazanitz, John Mullen, and Mary Waters. Which is the, and, well, Mary all, Waters is my... Friend. She's my friend. She's at Harvard. Okay. My intellectual coach. She's right. not at CUNY. Right. But what they, they have, in many ways, a very optimistic picture. They, they certainly they do. They interviewed young adults, 18 to 32, mm -hmm. and looked at you know, how they were doing. Most of them were doing better than their parents. Yep. And they were moving into the mainstream economy. Most of them probably as lower middle class, but they were moving into the mainstream yep. economy. Yep. So they were not, and in fact, they in some ways had an advantage being members of the second generation over native minorities. In, in many cases, their parents were better educated, came you know, with strong ambitions to do better here. So there's op there is you know, an optimism. Um, I think we also know that there's a lot of intermixing among mm, them. That's there's the going to, I think there's going to be a lot of intermarriage <laughs> among them because they're going to school together, they're going to college together, they're going to be working together. So I think we're going to see that. It's going to be a, a, a New York, and they, well, they think of themselves as New Yorkers. I mean, there are, their studies show that, that they think of themselves as New Yorkers. Uh, but there are some clouds on the horizon, yes, as let's, they say. Okay, go ahead. And one of the clouds is race. Yep, because talk about bla it. I mean, that's an issue particularly for black immigrants. It's still a dilemma. For, it's a, it is, and for Caribs. It is a dilemma in New York, and I think people are not always aware of this. First of all, we are in a city with deeply entrenched racial inequalities. New York is one of the most residentially segregated said, yep. cities in the country. What, third something? It's high. Third, a yeah. third metro area. Okay. It, it is really high. Um, and, of course, that has implications right. because people live in neighborhoods, the schools aren't as good, yep. the services aren't as good, the crime is higher. Uh, you know, so I think this is a problem for immigrants also. Okay, so that's an issue. A big other cloud on the horizon, which we have not spoken about, is the issue of undocumented. And Please. I think we need to talk Address about it. that. Go ahead. All right, in New York, this is the big issue in the country, yep. and it's an important issue in New York. Go ahead. New York has, by estimates, Half a million undocumented. Out of eight point two. So it's million. one point out of six. Okay. All right, but that really minimizes the impact. Go ahead. Because undocumented immigrants often live in mixed status families. So in other words, they'll live in a family or an extended family where someone might be a legal immigrant, and even more likely, their children born in the U.S. are citizens. Are citizens because we have birthright citizenship yep. in this country. Yep. So. It ripple has ripple effects beyond just the 500, the half a million, mm -hmm. okay? Now, what does this mean? For the immigrants, it means limits on what kinds of jobs they can get. They are in jobs where you don't need to show identification mm -hmm. or where they don't look too carefully. It means that they're often worried about complaining. They're worried often about you know, uh, agitating for higher wages. Well, I'm sick, sick leave. Sick, yes. They're often without benefits, okay. yes, because they're often working off the books. Uh, they are worried about deportation. You know, 2012, there were 400,000 deportations in the country as a whole. Immigrants are worried about being deported. They are the not eligible. Yeah, they are not eligible for most government benefits. One of the few is emergency Medicaid. Yep. So this is a, a and for their children, we have studies that show that parents who are undocumented are often worried and don't apply for or seek out services that their citizen children are eligible right, for. Right, right. So this is a problem. And of course, we get to the dreamers, right, if we can call them the dreamers. Let's, let the, what about the children who come over here? They're three, four, or five years old. They're undocumented. They've gone through the whole system. Right. They're in college because they can go to CUNY. CUNY has been very good about yep. having yep. outreach yep. programs yep. to tell people they can go. And then what happens? They try to get a job, and they face the same problems. They are not able to get decent jobs. They're not even able to leave the country because they can't get, back, get back in. in. Yeah. They can't get any kind of federal scholarships or anything. They're not eligible. So this is a terrible thing. Now, this is not something that New York City can do much about. But this I mean, is you a can, federal issue. Right. I mean, clearly you're talking about that. But I mean, the, the New York State Dream Act would have well, been 
at least an incremental it step forward. Been. It Talk about been. Well, what that, that just means did. and well, what that might would happen. Have made, that would have been allowed them to get financial aid, right, from the state, which would have been good. And maybe it, it just didn't get through. So that would have been a step. But really the step that it's needs feds. to be taken is federal, which means that they need to have a pathway to legalization and ultimately citizenship. We can't have... You know, there are 11 to 12 million undocumented immigrants in this country. You can't have them, you know, living and working here and outside of the legal system and not eligible for benefits, not eligible to, to be, participate in the society. So, you know, this is a problem for New York City. Now, de Blasio is, Mayor de Blasio is talking about an ID. You know, he's a, a progressive mayor. He wants to do things. And this is a progressive city. It's not a city that we're not you know, Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> We're not Alabama. We're not going after undocumented immigrants. Uh, you know, the city tries to be helpful. It tries to... But, and the, and, but and the previous a, administration was very good. Very positive Was very on positive. This. All of the mayors yep, have been. Yep. So the question, you know, because they're in New York. In fact, there was another funny story about Giuliani. Go you ahead. know, when he was mayor, Giuliani was very good on the undocumented issue. Yep. But Absolutely. then when he was campaigning for president, excuse me, exactly. he was completely different. And there was, again, something in the Times, I remember reading it, said he's a long way from Ellis Island. And that's, true. you know, when you're in New York, it's political suicide for anybody running for office in New York not to be pro him. You know what? I think both with Giuliani and with Bloomberg and certainly mm. Dinkins and Koch before they this all... is sincere. Yeah, they have it's immigrant not... background. Right, because that's who they are. Okay, you've got the ear of the mayor, and you've got him for a half hour. What's the first thing you tell him, and you tell him twice? What's what's well, the first couple of things you tell him? Well, I guess on this undocumented issue, anything that he can do, which he's trying, which he's trying. I mean, I think that's the big one. I mean, reducing racial inequality in the schools, yes, that's a big one, because so many of the children these of immigrants... Are, these are he's hugely trying. big. These are big subjects. You know, in some ways, you know, these issues that affect immigrants are not just immigrants. Yeah, it's issues. universal, yeah. They are issues for everybody, mm. because, you know, they're not just immigrant issues. The undocumented issue is an immigrant issue. But, you know, having good education for your children so they can move up into 21st century professional sure. managerial sure. jobs is not an immigrant issue. Okay, let me... Let me let me do. Let me ask the prognostication <laughs> question, which is always, you know, a, a difficult one. Looking ahead ten years, the next, the, the, the next edition of this, what trends do you see now that might, we might be talking about in ten years? Well, I, I, it's certainly likely that we're going to have continued immigration into right. the city. I mean, the city. I think one of the there's a wonderful demographic chapter by Joe uh, Salvo, Salvo and uh, Peter Loeb right. from the Department of City Planning. Excellent. In which they show the sort of dem. After all, people you know, die, people leave the city, and then people come in and people are born here. Sure. So, I mean, there's a there's lot churn. of churning. Yep. Yes. So, but one of the dynamic aspects of, of, of New York City's population has been immigrant inflows. Yep. In fact, without immigrant inflows, this city would be a tiny, much smaller city. Yeah. And, you know, we'd be closing schools. Right. Not, not they right. wouldn't be overcrowded. Right, right, right. right. So, um, I think that we're going to be seeing continued immigration. Now, I know Joe and Peter talk about the increasing number of Chinese. Right. And that that's that's and, you know, there'll be new group. I, you know, who knows? You know, one of the things about this is there are You're a lot of surprises. Well, there are a lot of surprises. Yeah. You know, who would have known, you know, back that in 1965 that this wow. would be the city would be Forget like this. It. And then Liberia and Staten Island. No, I mean, we, there are surprises. There are surprises. Uh, so we don't know. I think we can say that there will be continued inflows into the city that the future of the second generation is critical. We don't know what's going to happen with the undocumented. One hopes, one imagines that there'll be some federal legislation because it's such an untenable situation. Okay, we'll have to stop there. You'll have to come back before <laughs> 10 years. Thanks to Nancy Foner for being on the show. See you next week here on CUNY TV. Excellent. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.